Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. I am happy to say that ZW has finally done it. They have created a cooled version of their ASI 585 camera. So we now have the ZW ASI 585 MC Pro camera for astrophotography. And this is the cheapest cooled astrophotography camera in ZW's range of cameras. And I am very, very happy to see that because if you have been watching my channel for a while, you, you know that I have been using and loving the Toptech cooled astrophotography camera with the same IMX 585 sensor deep behind this OEG that I have here. And I love that camera so much that I've been using it almost exclusively despite its tiny sensor. And even though I have an APS-C size sensor from the same manufacturer, it's also called as photography camera. It gives me a much better field of view. But for some reason, I've just been using this rather than the APS-C size sensor. So knowing that ZW finally was making a cooled version with the same sensor, so that ZW users with, for instance, the ZW ASI Air control system are not left behind makes me really, really happy. And so I have used this camera on the Bode Galaxy together with the Cigar Galaxy, is I think the name of the, the galaxy next to it. Uh, using my Newtonian telescope that I have here in the background. And this actually gave me per pretty much the perfect framing. So I'll show you the results during the video. So of course, stay tuned. But first, let's talk about the specifications of the camera. So I am currently on ZW's website and we have in this, this camera and you can see the price. The price is 600 US dollars. And for a cooled astrophotography camera, that is really cheap. But let's look at the actual specifications. You can see that the sensor is small. It is one over 1.2 inch sensor with the uh, 11 millimeters per 6.3 millimeters dimensions. So this is even smaller than the ASI 533 MC Pro, which costs a couple of hundred dollars more. But what makes up for that is that we do get a good resolution and especially we get small pixels. You can see the pixel size is 2.9 micrometers. At the same time, we're getting a very docile sensor with no amp glow, meaning that it is very easy to calibrate. And that's why I see this sensor and I see this camera as pretty much like almost a replacement for the ASI 183 MC Pro, which also has a fairly small sensor with tiny 2.4 micrometer pixels, but slightly older sensor tech. And talking about sensor tech, by the way, you can see on the screen that we get up to 47 frames per second with this camera. And so that means that this camera is suitable, like very much suitable for both deep sky astrophotography, but also planetary astrophotography. And in fact, ZW had released an uncooled version specifically for planetary lunar and solar astrophotography. So it's like almost as if its secondary purpose is for deep sky astrophotography, but I've actually only used it for DSO, including my, my Tope Tech camera there with the same sensor. I've never used it for planetary, even though I know it can be. It's just my specialty is DSO and I love deep sky astrophotography. So with that, let's look a bit at the field of view that you can get with various telescopes using this camera, because as I mentioned, it is a small sensor. And by when you have a, a small sensor, that means you have a limited field of view. At the same time, small sensors are somewhat easier to use because you don't need to have perfect optics and the stars in the corners, they will always be good. So it's like, it, it is a, a trade-off. I'm currently showing you the field of view as it would be with the Bode and Sigur galaxy. And this is actually exactly the field of view that I used to capture those two galaxies together. And this is using a, a focal length of 512 millimeters, which is what my Newtonian telescope up there has. If I look at another uh, galaxy like M51, you can see that it's slightly small in this sensor, but it is a good fit for that sensor in terms of the field of view. It's especially with a small 2.9 micrometer pixels compared to like the very traditional 3.76 uh, size pixels on like the IMX 571 or the uh, IMX 533 sensors. So this is already, we can see it is going to be a good match for galaxies of like medium apparent size. And even if I look with my Newton telescope at something like M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, which is starting to get a bit larger, it's actually a perfect fit for our field of view with that Newtonian telescope. So what about if I were using like a small refractor, let's say the red cat. So let's say my focal length is roughly 250 millimeters. Now you can see 
on M33, this is actually still really good. But on something like M51, uh, it starts to give you a bit too small. I mean, the small pixels will definitely help. But this is, I think, very interesting to see. That said, if you're using a small refractor like the Red Cat, where you're going to be good is larger objects like M42 with a small refractor fits really, really well in that particular field of view. If we go to even something larger like M31, that's where we start to get near the limit. Still, it is a very good field of view and I could rotate my sensor to get something a bit better. So I could frame M31 like this and we are still able to fit it in the field of view. Although with dithering, etc., we might get a bit of cropping going on. There. And staying on M31, if I get to my Newtonian telescope, you can see that now we are just like concentrating on focusing on the center of the galaxy. So our field of view starts to simply not be enough depending on what we want to do. And if I were to go to like 800 millimeters focal length, that's where like M31 is completely <laughs> not really good for this. But something like M51 would be actually very valid for like an 8 inch Newtonian telescope with a focal length of 800 millimeters. With, as you can see, a very good actually field of view for that particular galaxy. So that gives us a very good idea of the field of view and the uses of such a small camera sensor in a really cheap astrophotography camera. What about things like read noise and full well depth and dynamic range of the sensor? If you have no idea what those statistics are, by the way, just know that higher full well is better lower read noise is better and dynamic range is basically a combination of those two factors higher dynamic range is better if you really want to learn more about that i have some videos on the topic i will put a link up above and also down in the description so we can see that the zw camera has an approach where uh, the read noise will suddenly get lower at gain 252. This is when we go from the low conversion gain to the high conversion gain. And so we get a much lower read noise, while at the same time, we have also a lower full well depth. But as a net, it basically increases the dynamic range from 9.5 at that range, at that gain to 11. And if you look at another camera with the uh, IMX 585 sensor, so, so the uh, camera, I think it's the Uranus uh, C Pro by Player One, and they have the same sensor, but they do that switch from low conversion gain to high conversion gain at unity gain. So earlier, slightly more to the left of ZW. ZW has decided to do it slightly more to the right. And that means that unlike the ASI 533MC Pro, where I can say like definitely you should always use gain 100 and stop thinking about it, it may not be the case for this camera. If you are in a fairly dark area, like let's say border five or better, so you're in like in, in suburbs or darker areas, you may indeed want to always use this camera with a gain of 252 because then you minimize the read noise, which in your darker skies, you will have more trouble overwhelming. Or if you're shooting in narrowband, even from the city, like here in Tokyo, it also might make sense to have this gain to 252 to really take advantage of the lower read noise while still having a very respectable dynamic range of 11 stops. But if you're imaging broadband from the city, from Tokyo, then you don't care that much about low read noise because you're going to completely swamp the read noise with your super high level of light pollution. That is not an advantage, by the way. Light pollution is never good. And there's actually a very good video that has been made on that topic recently. I'll put the link up above and down below. It's not one of my videos, but it is really, really well done. I highly recommend you have a watch. But yeah, going back to my light polluted city, uh, I'm in Tokyo, so I don't really care that much about low read noise. Let's look at what we can get uh, with gain like 50. We have a fairly high read noise of 5.5 electrons, but again, it's nothing in broadband compared to li my light pollution. That gives us 12 stops of dynamic, ra dynamic range. So I have twice as much dynamic range, one full stop more dynamic range than at gain 252. So by moving the point at which we switch between low conversion gain and high conversion gain to the right, ZW kind of like gives us this choice. It has drawbacks as well, because in the high conversion gain mode, you can only have up to 11 stops of dynamic range. The player one camera, on the other hand, we're looking at their uh, charts there, can have up to almost 12 
stops of dynamic range. In the case of the Player One camera, we're getting back to somewhere where I would always recommend to use the gain that gives you the high conversion gain. Not so with the ZW offering. Let's look quickly at another spec as well. This is for this particular sensor. So it is true for all versions of this uh, sensor. It is the uh, quantum efficiency, which is quite high. And in particular, you can see that in the infrared, we still have a very high sensitivity for that sensor in infrared. So if you're using uh, a filter like the IDAS GNB filter for galaxies that I've also featured on the channel in the past, this is a very, very good sensor to pair it with. I will, by the way, quickly go back to the uh, change between low conversion gain and high conversion gain. What about my Tope Tech camera? When does it switch? Well, the answer is that in Nina, it doesn't. You can choose across the full gain range whether you want to be low conversion gain or high conversion gain. So you don't have like that weird step in the middle. You just choose and you have full power. That's actually my preferred approach. But the Tope Tech version of this camera is $50 more expensive. And you also have less flexibility with the back focus distance that it consumes. The ZW camera by default has 17.5 millimeters of back focus, but simply by removing that ring adapter in the front, we can get it down to 6.5 millimeters of back focus, which is really tiny. And it's great if you're using something like a camera lens where your back focus is very limited. So definitely advantages and drawbacks per camera. So how have I attached this camera? to my Newton telescope to make it work. Well, it is a ZW camera, so you can simply use the ZW adapters. There are adapters that are available with the camera that gives you immediately the proper 55 millimeters of back focus distance, or you can use accessories from ZW. Here I have the ZW filter wheel with a UV IR cut filter. This is what I used. And I also have the ZW OEG with a ZW 120mm mini for guiding. And I can simply screw the ASI 5A5 MC Pro into this, and I am good to go. And this is compared to the, <laughs> the exact same thing, but in Tope Tech blue flavor. So do you prefer red or blue? <laughs> but really, I'm really happy to see that because now ZW ASI Air users have this budget cooled astrophotography camera alternative available to them. And this is Awesome. By the way, I will have all of the links, of course, down in the video description if you're interested in getting this camera or just having a look at the detailed specs. Okay, now we're going to go inside and look at my results on the Bode and Cigar Galaxies. At the time, just because I know everyone wants to use high conversion gain, I used gain 252 and I used 30 second exposures with my f3.5 telescope here in Tokyo. And already I could see the histogram like move towards the right. So I was a bit filling up those uh, those well in the uh, in the pixel, something to keep in mind. And we're also, while I was using it, something I noticed very interesting between the cooling system of the ZW camera compared to my Tope Tech camera with the same sensor is the ZW camera is much less aggressive. It will progressively ramp up to your target temperature. It has no problem reaching it. So I had set my room temperature to 24 degrees Celsius and the target at minus 10. It reached it within five minutes. The Tope Tech camera goes full blast immediately <laughs> and in the same conditions reach that target temperature within like 30 seconds to one minute. But I know a lot of people don't like that because they're afraid of thermal shock on the glass of the camera, etc. So they prefer the more gradual ZW approach. Oh, one thing, by the way, about the Tope Tech that the ZW doesn't have, it has a dew heater on the sensor window with four levels of heat that you can apply. So that's a small advantage. But again, this camera is 50 US dollars more. It's still an excellent camera. I'll also have links down in the description if you are interested. OK, with that, let's get inside to see my results on the Bode and Sigur Galaxy. Before you do that, by the way, this is always a lot of work. So if you want to help out the channel and encourage my work, you can go down below, subscribe, like the video, leave a comment. What do you think about this camera? What do you think the results will be? And if you're feeling very generous, you can join my Patreon as a member and some ranks get access to my videos early and without ads. Or you can join my channel as a member using the join button next to the subscribe button. All of that helps a huge lot, but that's not important. Let's go inside and look at the results. Oh, and by the way, I did test the sensor using the SharpCap sensor analysis tool. 
and we're getting sensibly the same results as the charts provided by ZW. Uh, we get a slightly lower read noise actually, but also slightly lower full well depth for roughly the same dynamic range. So as far as I can tell, uh, correct me if I'm wrong by looking at the numbers, but it's very close to the published specs and I have no issues with those. And we're inside, so this is going to be the result of one night of imaging on the Bode and Cigar galaxies. I used gain 252 to be in the high conversion gain mode with 30 second exposures. And from what I could see, yeah, from a very light polluted city, it actually makes sense to go back to gain 50. To also note, with gain 252, I used offset of 7. So this very low offset was actually enough to make sure that I didn't get dark pixels. So what are the results? We have them here. I'm really sorry about this donut shape that you get on the left hand side. This is because I forgot to take my flat. I removed the camera from the telescope to do the sensor analysis in sharp cap before doing the flats. So yeah, my, my next flats were not, uh, not perfect. So apologies about that. But you can see with my Newtonian telescope there, we have the perfect framing for those two, ga those two galaxies. And this frame is actually with uh, dither and drizzling going on. And to show you a bit how much detail we can achieve with like a fairly small telescope with just a focal length of 510 roughly uh, millimeters and blur exterminator used on a drizzled image. This is the before, this is the after. And yeah, I can, I, I really like that we're getting so much details. And I think this is really thanks to those really small pixels that give us a great pixel scale, even with relatively small telescopes. And that's why I see this particular camera sensor as being somewhat of a successor to the 183 sensor. Anyway, let's show you my final image with those two galaxies. You can still see the donuts. Again, apologies about that. But you can see we have a, a nice amount of detail on the both galaxy and on the cigar galaxy. Uh, remember, this is with a single night of data. Also, the wind was very, very strong. So I did have to throw away a lot of frames, but I am very happy with the results. We have a great field of view. We have a great amount of details. We have a small sensor, so it's very fast and quick to do the stacking in PixInsight. There's no amp glow, so I didn't even bother to use dark frames. It's just a very easy to use, very docile sensor that is very versatile and very cheap for a cold ass photography camera. And that's pretty much all I've got to say about this, this camera. It's a cracking little camera. It's 600 or 599 US dollars. It can be used with the ASI Air. The cooling works well. And if you're an astrophotographer on a budget and you've been like eyeing a cool astrophotography camera, but you're a beginner, so you're using the ASI Air, it's a great alternative. Of course, you can also go with the 533 MC Pro, which is an amazing camera in its own right, but you need to add a couple hundred of dollars to achieve that. So, and you get bigger pixels, so slightly less good of an image scale for small refractors and the like. By the way, I didn't notice any vibration issues with the fan because we know that's been a problem in the past, but at least with my sample of the camera, I didn't notice any problems. And that is my conclusion. If you have to have fun with a small, cheap, cool as fluffy camera, go for it. And if you think the sensor is too small, it doesn't have enough full well depth, whatever, don't go for it. <laughs> but I personally really, really like this sensor and thus I like this camera. And if you want to support me, by the way, you can join my Patreon, join the channel as a member, subscribe, like, let us know what you think about this camera or anything else for that matter. You can ask me any question you like. I don't know if I can answer, but ask away. But more important than all of that, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.